You ready? Amen. Open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Luke chapter 17, James chapter 1. Three openings. Hallelujah. You know, one thing that you learn around here or see with us is that what we preach and how we preach is fairly common, but not everywhere does it this way. We, we major on pertinent truth. Pertinent truth. Truth that is pertinent for your life. Applicable for your life today. The other type of truth would be historical truth. Historical truth might be truth, but it's not pertinent for me. It gives you some information, but it doesn't find a life application very easily. Does that make sense? Yeah. The Bible is full of historical truth. Some of it is exciting to get us into a certain arena, but much of the historical truth we find is not pertinent for me today. Okay? Pertinent truth helps us live a powerful life. And, and you know, here at church, that's what we're, we're endeavoring to do. You know, when we teach things, it's, to, it's designed not to just fill a couple hours on Sunday morning. Coming to church for us is not just about, you know, uh, abiding some time, doing the Christian thing, because all the other Christians are in church, I might as well be. No, what we do, I expect church to be this place where disciples are trained, where Christians are edified, trained, perfected, equipped to go out and change the world. You know, that's what Jesus did. Jesus took uh, ordinary people. He took fishermen, IRS agents, accountants, doctors, ordinary people. And he turned, him, he turned them into powerful disciples who understood the commission of the Lord, who endeavored to witness to the world, who took on that great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. to go out and make a difference and continue His ministry. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's what I expect Christians to be today. Yeah. We are not just to, to bide time in our mundane world keeping church as part of it. I, that's not fun for me. I want to have an army of holy saints. Amen who understand things of God so they can do what's necessary in the world to change it. I'm not talking about political and governmental world change. I'm talking about personal life change. Personal life miracles. When there's a need, the Christian is there. When there's a question mark, the Christian has the answer. That's what I expect church to be. So when we teach things, it's not just to add a little teaching to your notebook. It's not just for you to say, well, I, I, I raised the banner of this church. I like this one. This is where I go. I'm so proud to be part of this one. Right. No, it, it's, it's designed so that we come together, we learn things together, we go out and practice them and do them and come back and testify. Here's what happened. I did it. It worked for me. I won a soul. I led someone to Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 That's the kind of teenagers I expect to show up on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Those that aren't just kind of bad, bad you know, passing time because mom and dad said I had to. I want to see one with a little sparkle in their eye for God. Amen. If I see a little sparkle in their eye for Jesus, then I can help train them how to fish for men. Amen. Amen. How, to make, how to make a difference. How to feel like you're making a difference in the earth. Yes, yeah. Praise God. So, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 4. From last week we said this. I want to read this scripture. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. The spirit of faith believes and speaks. Amen. If you ever think to yourself, well, I have faith, then you'll be saying something very sharp, very focused, very pertinent for your life. Very uh, resemblant of the Word of God. Matching what the Holy Spirit has said through the, in the Scriptures. That will be what you say. That will be how you think. That will come out of your mouth because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> While we're in 2 Corinthians, I want to show you this. Just, just pause over here in, in chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And keep this in mind as we move along. 
verse 19. For the Son of God, or no, verse 18. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Sylvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes. And in him, amen. That means so be it. To the glory of God through us. So I just want you to see that when God makes a promise, the answer to it is yes. When you remind God of a promise, he never says, well, yes, and today, and maybe no. You know, have you ever heard that before? Somebody says, well, let's pray. And they say, well, you know, God doesn't always answer prayer. Sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. You ever heard that before? There's no scripture in the Bible that says that. The scripture actually says, he always says yes. Now, as soon as you start believing that, you'll get your prayer answered quicker. Now, there is one stipulation. It must be a promise. We're not talking about just some flippant thing you come up with. We're talking about promises of God. Amen. Covenant promises of God that are already laid out in Scripture, He always says yes to. Yeah. Like healing. Yeah. We have evidence that that's, He always wants everybody healed. Did you know He wants everybody healed? Yes. Yes. The leper came to Him and said, If you will, you can make me clean. He said, I will. That means I want to. If you want to, you can make me clean. He says, I want to. If he wants the leper to be healed, he wants you to be healed. Yeah. He healed everybody that came in the Bible. That means he'll heal, heal everybody that comes now. Yeah. Also, he wants everybody saved. Yeah. Yeah. We know that he wants everybody saved because the Bible says that. So that's a covenant promise, to be saved. Yeah. Now, covenant promises don't automatically come to pass. That's right. That's true. That's right. You have to admit that. We have to admit these things so that we don't get caught and hung up trying to receive an answer from God. Because when we get hung up in the briar patch, not understanding God properly, then, our, then we pray and we wonder and then the question marks start forming. Well, I wonder if God, well, I guess I am. Well, I don't know if this and I don't know when and I, one day I guess God will come through for me. So you've got to understand this properly so you don't have a briar patch to go through. Hallelujah. Covenant promises, he always says yes to. And promise does not mean that the Bible has to say, I promise you. A long time ago, I had a family member that I was talking about the promises of God and, and they already had some sermon that they'd heard and they said, well, there's only one time God ever made a promise in the Bible. It's when He promised not to flood the earth. He said, I promise. I said, no, you don't understand. I'm not talking about when He said, I promise, because God don't have to say, I promise. Matter of fact, that's not how we live our life. We don't have to promise people. Our words should be yes and no and we should mean it. When God says it, He don't have to say, I promise you. Now, I really promise you. When we read something in the Bible, it sounds real good. We don't say, now, do you promise? That's what kids do. That's what little children do. To make sure mom and dad's going to keep their word. They don't need to do that if mom and dad keeps their word. In the Bible, God says many things. He says, I will X, Y, Z. That means he will. He, he can't take it back. He can't lie. If he said it, he's going to do it. That's a promise. There's many conditional promises. If you do this, then I'll do this. If you believe this, then I'll do this. Amen? Yeah. So we got hundreds and hundreds and thousands of promises in the Bible. And to everyone, he says yes. Hallelujah. When, when you think about joy, the scripture talks about joy. When you think about peace, the scripture talks about But You need some joy in your life? Yes, you can have it. Matter of fact, you can have it in the morning. How many of you have ever needed joy in the morning? If you, if you believe the Bible, you'll go to bed sometimes thinking, okay, tomorrow I'm going to be full of joy. And all of a sudden it happens. It's just the way he built things. We get refreshed and joy cometh in the morning. Our inward man is renewed day by day. And if you want that inward man to be strong day by day, you'll stay in the Word of God. That's how you build your faith and keep strong assurance of faith in your heart. You stay in the Word of God. Amen. You don't lay in your bed twiddling your thumbs, asking God to give you more faith. You can't get faith that way. Amen. You might as well just sit there, twiddle your thumbs, and sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Or your favorite song off the radio. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. 
You know, Brother Kenneth Hagin used to do uh, faith seminars and, and uh, faith revivals and healing revivals. And back in the old day, people would come to church every day. And they'd come to church twice a day. So he'd travel around the, the United States and he would hold these meetings in churches. And they would have day meetings. They'd have a morning session. And then they'd have a night session. And this would go on for a week or two or three. And uh, sometimes four, five, or six. He said one of them went nine weeks. And so after three weeks, you know, the pastor, Brother Hagin would teach on faith in the afternoons or the mornings. And then he would preach on healing at night. And he wouldn't pray for the sick until about the third week. Because people's faith needed to get built up. And so after about three weeks of teaching on faith, the pastor would be thinking, there's no way that he can do another message on faith. He said everything there is to say about it. But he'd come up with something new. The Bible's full of things that help our understanding about faith and belief and how important that is to God. Not just a general faith, there is a God. My goal, our goal, is to learn how to, to believe God. Amen. The, whole, the whole world believes in God. Like I said before, even atheists believe in God. Right? Amen. I read an article. They hooked them up to lie detector tests. The, 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 like 20 or 30 or what, however many. They hooked up 20 atheists to lie detector tests and asked them if they believe in God. And they all said no and the thing went crazy. They all meant yes. <laughs> Everybody believes in God. That's not in itself noble. Because God put that in us to all know that there's a creator. But to believe God separates the men from the boys. So we all need to learn how to believe God. What does that mean? To believe God. Because believing God is how miracles happen. Believing God is how your life gets on top of the mountain. Glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 17. Start with verse 5. And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. So the Lord waved his magic wand and said, There you go. You're the special one. I've chosen to have faith. No, he didn't do that. And don't ever think that about somebody. Don't ever look at somebody and say, Wow. They've got such great faith and I just don't have any. Don't ever do that. You don't find that kind of speech in the Bible. No. He's given to every man the measure of faith. Yeah. Those that seem to have great faith have just developed it. Those that seem to have great faith just jumped in. So why don't you just jump in? He said increase our faith. And this is very important because I know that you felt that way before. Most Christians have felt like, you know what, I don't really have that great faith like I should. Okay, here's what you do. Verse 6, the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Now, <clears throat> now we're going to compare it to the mustard seed, which is the smallest seed in all the earth. Okay? So Jesus is going to compare faith to a mustard seed, where the truth is, everybody in here, if I asked you, do you have faith? Yes, I do. Then the next question would be, faith in what? What are we talking about? Faith in God, yes, okay, that's great, that's general, that's good. But what about other things? Faith in what God has said. We need to know the Bible to have faith in what God has said. So we all have faith, and, and if you've been in church for longer than a week, you've heard enough scripture to have some faith in those scriptures. You have heard some things, and they went in, and you said, I believe that. You walk out of Sunday thinking, wow, I believe even stronger today. So therefore, you have faith, you believe. Same thing. Have faith, believe. Same thing. He says, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Now he's going to tell us something. Now, the reason he uses mustard seed, I believe, is because it seems very insignificant. You take a little tiny mustard seed, you look at it in the palm of your hand, it looks like nothing. It looks like a piece of dirt. Insignificant. But out of it comes this huge tree or full fruitful plant. How could that happen? Well, it's a miracle. I can't explain it. Nobody can explain it. It's a miracle. God put DNA, miraculous DNA, in every seed. And it's a miracle. Amen. It seems insignificant, though. From the natural side, it's like, how could that possibly be? I got to do what with it? Put it in the ground? What is that going to do? 
Okay? He says if you have faith as a mustard seed, what do you think you're going to have to do with it? You're going to have to plant it. Uh -huh. To make the mustard seed do something, you have to plant the mustard seed. To make your faith do something, you have to plant it. To make your belief do something for you, you have to do something with it. Amen. Yeah. Right. To make miracles out of what you believe, you have to do something with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Verse 6, So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you might say to the mulberry tree, be plucked up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say something. You with me? Yes. So if you have faith, you will say something. Amen. Amen. Yeah. If you have faith, you will need to plant that faith in the kingdom of God. You will need to say those words. The spirit of faith is to believe and say. If you have belief, you will say. If you have belief and you sit there quietly, it will never produce a miracle for you. You can sit there all day long believing something and nothing will happen. You can die and go to heaven believing, and nothing will happen. When we think to ourselves, well, I believe in God, that's okay to say, and I'm glad. Are you doing anything else? Are you doing anything else? Are you saying anything else? Amen? Amen. Matter of fact, I don't ever use that term that way. Because it's kind of, sometimes it turns into a hopeless term. Well, I'm believing God. It's like it's never happening, but I'm believing God. I've told you the story about how I got married. I used my faith to get married. I used my faith to find a wife. What do, what do I mean by that? Well, I found a scripture in the Bible, Mark eleven twenty four. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Well, I desired a wife. I make no bones about it. I asked God if it was okay, and I didn't get a no, so I felt like I'm getting married. And so I asked God for a wife in Jesus' name. And the scripture said, believe that you receive and you shall have. So I receive her and I believed that then. And that was it for me. I believed I received her. And so for the whole next year, I never prayed about it again. Never, every time I thought about it, I never re-requested. You know, sometimes re-requesting gets you in trouble. Once you plant the seed, you leave it in the ground. Once you say what needs to be said, you make your request be made known to God, then you leave that thing in the ground. How ridiculous would it be if a farmer went out there, planted all of his seed, and then the next day he went out there and looked around and got his shovel, started dicking them up. Let's, let, me, let, me, let me redo it. Maybe I need to 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 redo it. Six days go by and nothing. He goes back out there. I may, I may, maybe I need to redo it. Maybe I need to redo it. Plant your seed and, and have confidence that the kingdom of God works like it said. You pray it in faith, you receive it, you obey the scripture, and you leave it in there. And if you ever think about it again, you just, you just throw some little thanks on it. Thank God. That's all I did for the next year. Every time I thought, oh, thank God. Glory to God, I got me a wife. Hallelujah. How wonderful. I'm sure God's preparing her for me. I'm sure God's preparing me for her. That's wonderful. Hallelujah. I, I needed some preparing. Every good, holy, wonderful wife wants a good, holy, wonderful husband. I looked in the mirror and I thought, no wonder I ain't married yet. So I got to work. So for the next year, if somebody would ask me, when you get married, Chas? You know, I was in my late 20s or mid 20s, late 20s. And uh, when you get married, Chess, I don't know, but I received my wife last year. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I got her somewhere. I hadn't seen her yet. Glory to God. I didn't say, well, I'm believing God. I don't know either. My clock's ticking. I'm believing God. <laughs> and then the next year goes by. She hadn't showed up yet, so I'm still preparing me. Thanking God. Anybody ask me? I mean, I told probably, 
probably 20, 30 people who asked me during this time period. And I just said, oh, Mark eleven twenty four says, what things forever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive and you'll have it. Well, I desired a wife, believe that I received her. I got her. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the next year goes by. People ask me the same thing, quoted the same thing. The next year goes, four years, five years, six years. Never even thought about changing my confession. Never even thought, never even crossed my mind to repray. <clears throat> I had so much confidence on that scripture, so much confidence on that one conversation I had with God and His goodwill for my life. So much confidence. Now, I didn't need to have a wife that week. Like, if you're about to die, you need to, an answer this week. You don't have time to be waiting around for somebody to ask you so you can confess your scripture. You got to better jump on, jump on top of it and get your answer immediately. Amen. A covenant promise is that you can be healed and live. Amen. Having a wife is not a covenant promise. It's a desire of your heart. You have to toss it to God, talk to the Lord about it, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you in your request. Amen. Oh, that's good. That's good. Endure for a while. Like, like being a CEO of a company. Some of you youngsters may want to be a CEO of a company. God, in Jesus' name, I want to be a CEO. Amen. You walk out the next door looking for the the letter of intent. Uh -huh. No, being a CEO of a company might take a while. Some things take a while. Some things are covenant promises and can be had today. Having food on your table is a covenant promise. You can have it today. Having enough money to pay the bills, you can have it immediately. Now, if you've dug a huge ditch for yourself, uh, let's go ahead and increase little by little for a little while and walk through the, the rocky road and you'll get through it. But you can have food on the table. Amen. You with me? Six years go by, no wife. Seven years go by, no wife. Never once did I, did I think that I need to repray and that God's not going to answer me. Never once. That's called faith. That's called faith. I was confident. I was excited about it. I knew my wife would show up and she finally showed up. Matter of fact, she showed up in year five. I just didn't know it. She showed up in year five sitting one seat behind me in my home church. Some of you were there. And then it dawned on me. And it dawned on her. We got married. If you'll just serve God, you'll get married. You'll just serve God at His place and His time and His will. And, 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 and use your faith a little. At least don't doubt and worry. <coughs> doubt and worry will just rob you. Mm -hmm. Doubt and worry is like an anchor in your path of life. Mm -hmm. Kenneth Hagin said, he said, I'd rather have a dope peddler in my church than a doubt peddler. Yes. Yeah. People peddling okay. doubt around. Well, I don't know if you can say that. You know, sometimes he says no. Well, I just don't know. You better, you better. We don't need that. No. If you're sick in your hospital, don't let the doubters in. Keep your flowers, send them to me later. <laughs> Keep your sympathy cards for later. I don't need no sympathy card. I need some faith cards or no card. Amen. Keep going. Keep going. If you want to have a miracle, if you want God to intervene in your life, you're going to have to keep the doubt away. Amen. And if it's people in your life, family members, it doesn't matter who it is. If there's doubters, you just ignore them for a while. Yes. All right. Praise, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So I got married by faith. Praise the Lord. Then I really had to use my faith. No, just kidding. You got to get married by faith. You got to stay married by faith. Hallelujah. And enjoy the ride. So if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can plan it. You'll say something. You'll say something if you have faith. And you'll say to the mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Problems will obey you. Symptoms will obey you. Hallelujah. Issues of life and challenges will yes. obey you if you do it. Yes. Hallelujah. I remember a story that Kenneth Copeland told a long time ago, my first formative years with the Lord. You know, these things impact you. When you hear real stories of God and feats of faith, they impact you. When you read the Bible, those, those testimonies should impact you. Yes. Who? A human being had faith and got a miracle? Who? Life-changing testimony. Well, Kenneth Copeland told, told a story about his son got fever. And uh, 
you know, a little five-year-old, six, I don't know what he was. And uh, Kenneth Copeland, that night, prayed for him, laid hands on him. In the name of Jesus, you know, with all the right words yeah. and all the right faith. And went to bed. Son went to his room. Kenneth went to his room. Laying in bed, the devil saying, you better go check on him. 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 Natural wisdom says you better go check on him. And he said, I already prayed. I'm believing and I am not moving from it. That's what faith looks Faith doesn't budge. Faith doesn't budge. I'm not budging. I'm not going in there. Now, if it's life or death and you hear screams, you know, you'll have to, you'll, you'll have to do something. But there's a time to not look at the symptom. There's a time Amen. to stand firm on your belief and nothing else. You're out on a limb? Yeah. But it's a strong limb. Unless you start walking around on it, goofing up with it, fall off. And uh, the next morning, they get up. And out of the corner of his eye, he can see that his son is still sick. They went to eat breakfast. The son is sitting at the table. He can see that he's still sick out of the corner of his eye. But he wouldn't look at him. He had already prayed. He already believed. He already commanded the fever to go. The fever has to go. The fever must go. If you say to the mulberry, it will go in the sea. If you believe that scripture that firmly, it will do it. Amen. That's called faith. He sat at that table. He wouldn't look up. They ate breakfast, and, and Brother Copeland's about to leave and leave the house. And uh, he, felt, he felt his son tugging on his pants or his jacket or whatever. He felt his son tugging on him. Daddy, Daddy. He wouldn't look at him. He said, Daddy, look, 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 look. I'm healed. <laughs> big deal? Yeah, it's a big deal. An instant healing from breakfast to doorstep? Yeah. Why? Because someone believed God. That's what believing God will do for you. It will help your kids stay well. How about that? I remember James Robeson told a story about his son. His son, when he was a teenager, had some severe acne. And uh, embarrassed, you know how that is. And <clears throat> found out the truth about God. And, and uh, Brother James and his son sat down and talked about it and prayed and they decided that by his stripes, his son was healed. And he asked his son, do you, if you want to believe God for this, I'll help you. His son said, I do, Dad. I think God will heal me in Jesus' name. So they prayed, and he said, now, son, what are you believing? And his son said, I believe that I'm going to be healed tomorrow morning when I wake up in Jesus' name. So they prayed, they confessed, they rebuked it, they cast the thing out, they received healing, and did all those things. I don't know all the details, but they did what was necessary by faith. Yeah. Well, the next morning, Brother James wakes up, and he hears his son bawling and squalling from the room, from his room. He goes in there and says, what's the matter? His son's looking in the mirror. He says, Daddy, it didn't work. It didn't go away. We believed, and it didn't go away. He and his dad talked for a minute, and his dad convinced him. He said, now, son, we took a step of faith and believed God, didn't we? The son said, yeah. He said, there's no reason to budge because we don't look at the symptom to determine if it worked. So why don't we just hang on for a while? Why don't we just stay in faith until it does change? Because we already prayed. We already settled it. His son said, okay, Dad. So they did. Quit the crying. Quit the squalling over the symptoms. Within one month, acne free. Thank you, Jesus. Didn't have to repray. Didn't repluck up the seed. Didn't look back. You know, looking back at your faith decisions is a no-no. When you make a decision of will by faith, when you obey God, when you step out to trust Him, when you step out to go plan A and no plan B, when you step out in faith and believe God for something, don't look back. If you look back, you will waver. If you look back, you'll fall. Remember Lot's wife? She looked back at the faith decision to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. She turned to salt. It's an example. Don't look back. Amen. Don't look back at, well, what if? Well, I should have. Well, I wonder. Well, what if? No matter what you've done, whether it's a faith decision or a doubt decision, quit looking back. Just start today and make your right decision. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
Jesus said, no man walking in the kingdom of God, taking hold of the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom. Amen. Don't look back. Make your decision. Go after God. And don't you look back. That's right. Peter, when he started looking sideways or whatever, he fell in. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Peter was doing fine as long as he stuck to, the, stuck to the Word of God. As long as he obeyed and believed the Word of Jesus when he said, Come out on the water. Peter walked on water, produced a miracle. Until the Bible says, But when he saw the wind boisterous yeah. and the waves, he fell in. And Jesus said, Oh, Oh, why did you doubt? Has he ever said that to you? Don't feel bad about it. People get so offended about, you know, their faith getting examined. So they won't even examine it theirself. You're supposed to examine your own faith. Examine your own self. You have to examine your own self. And sometimes Jesus wants to tell you, why did you doubt? You need to let him say that to you. And then don't beat yourself up. Let it go on. That's good enough. Now let's move on. Peter didn't grovel in that mistake. He went on to work miracles and do the will of God for the rest of his life. Amen. Except for a little hitch here and there. <laughs> Praise God. Turn with me to James 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. James chapter 1. Verse 5. Now in this context, he's talking about wisdom, asking God for wisdom, which can be applied to anything. The principle of asking of God is what you find in here. So you can apply it to anything. He says this, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. The King James says, not wavering. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For do not let that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Notice those terms. No doubting, no wavering, no double-mindedness. When you make your decision, don't go back on it. When you make decisions of faith, you stick to it, you grit your teeth, you lock your eyes in, and you stay at it. If you'll do that without the him hawing around about it, well, I know we believed God, but you know, now I don't know. I feel you know. I don't know. That's what a doubter looks like. That's what a double-minded person looks like, look like. And they don't get miracles. Mm -hmm. okay. Keep going. Keep it's a principle of faith. Matter of fact, it says, Let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. True. You ever read it that way? Yeah. If you doubt, waver, and get double-minded... I can't even let you suppose you'll get anything. That means I need to tell you you won't get it. God won't help you at all. Come on. Can you imagine if you came for pastor's counsel and you sat there with your problem on the table and, and the pastor, what if I said, God won't help you? What if I said, don't even suppose that God will do anything for you. What would you do? If you're looking for Hallmark sympathy cards when you come into the pastor's council session, you can forget it. I don't do Hallmark. If you want to... John... Is it okay? Yeah. You want me to stay Bible or do you want me to do, do the other? You want me to get milky? You want milky faith, milky Christianity? No. Bring the Bible. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. 
To look somebody in the eye and say, don't suppose you'll get anything from the Lord. Do you think God will help me? I don't suppose so. See what faith looks like? Faith doesn't bring all these doubts in. So what I'll do after I say, no, I don't suppose God will help you at all. Then I'll say, but if you spend a little time with me, I'll help you. So when you don't go to the pastor, you go to God and you're talking about things and in, in dealing with issues in prayer, make sure you address some of these things. Mind faith, Lord. Holy Spirit, help me. He's your helper. Help me. Is there something I've missed? Help me. Am I, in, am I really in faith or am I kind of worried? I, I'm kind of worried. And then you jump up. Close the book. Jump on top of the worry. I'm not going to worry. Because if you believe something, you'll say it. I don't have to worry. I got a word. I got a word. If you believe it, you'll say it. That's what faith does. Faith doesn't, well, I guess tomorrow I'll pray some more. I guess I just need to pray more. No, you need to shut up more and start saying something that means something. More praying is not what Jesus said. If you have faith, you'll pray more. Come on. Right. Or do you want milk? You want milk? No. no. If you had faith, you'd just pray more. No. no. If you had faith, you'd say something out of your heart. Yeah. That's what faith looks like. Isn't this exciting? Yes. This is how you can change your own life. Yeah. You've, been, you've been thinking it was all this other stuff that you hadn't done, and if I was just a little more, and if I just pray a little more, then maybe. No, if you just say the right thing more and mean it. Why don't you stand up in the house and tell the house what's going to happen? Why don't you tell the bills what's going to happen here? Why don't you tell the future of your life for your family out loud? Why don't you get your wife to say it? Your, your husband, why don't you get your kids going in it? Amen. Hey kids, I want you to know all the bills are paid for this month. Yeah. Yeah. I want to tell you kids what I'm standing on. I got me a scripture. Quote the scripture. The next morning, hey, hey, remember that scripture? What are we standing on? What's going to happen this month? All the bills are paid, Dad. All the bills are paid. Amen. Glory. Yeah. Glory. Glory. Just showing you how faith people live. Real faith people live this way. Amen. Believing God means you live this way. You don't just sit around twiddling your thumbs, you know, hoping people think you believe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Wondering how come God hadn't answered your prayer. Keep going. He has answered your prayer. If you plant your seed, it's working. Right. Yeah. Eventually, you'll have fruit off of that little tiny seed if you'll just keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. <clears throat> I went to, uh, in, in 2009, I went to Uganda for a pastor's leadership training. So uh, myself and a preacher from Cleveland, I went with him really, uh, hooked up with this preacher who heads up an evangelistic, co evangelistic coordination of pastors in Uganda. So we went down to Uganda and uh, we were going to have two big conferences, maybe 300, 400 people in each of pastors and leaders to train them how to plant churches and some other things. And so um, it was exciting, you know, what a great deal. We, the, the, they had set it all up. It cost money. We brought all these pastors in from all around the territory. And they'd come and stay for three days. And so we landed in Uganda and uh, met with our coordinator pastor. And the first words out of his mouth was, yes, the territory we're headed to, we, we, we hopped in a bus, a little van, for about seven of us, eight of us. We hopped in the van, luggage on the top, we, we head off. Well, the first conversation is about the territory we're headed to first has been in a severe drought for 12 months. No rain. They've lost two crops. They've lost 12 lives because of the drought. Well, I heard the news and I thought, hmm, might have to say something. Might have to work a miracle here. We need rain. We can get rain because God gave us authority in the earth. Behold, I give you dominion over the, all the earth. The people of God cause rain in the Bible. 
the people of God cause rain now. Yeah. That's why America is plentiful. Anyway, so I'm on the bus and I'm thinking, okay, might have to handle this, might have to do something. Don't know what to do, but I'm going to do it. I'm sure that God will show me what to do when it comes. Sure, the thought crossed my mind, uh-oh. <laughs> and the reason I thought, uh-oh, is because i got to do something. No. <laughs> I'm responsible. So we show up, or we're, we're, we're headed off. It's a five-hour trip. We started at 6 in the morning. We were going to preach a couple meetings that, that evening, the afternoon and the evening. And so we're driving on, and uh, about at midway or maybe three or four hours into the trip, we stopped in a town to pick up another pastor who's going to the meeting. He's a Ugandan pastor. We pick him up. He gets in the car, and he's first things out of his mouth. Yep, yep, such and such territory that we're headed to. Been in a drought. It's terrible up there. I don't even know if any pastors are going to show up. And I thought, I have to do something here. I have to do something here. So we, we head up to the meeting. And uh, I know we heard it at least three times. I don't know the other, the th I can't remember the third time that we heard that conversation again about this drought and how severe and how terrible and how everybody's depressed. And they were. We showed up. Now, the, the preachers showed up. They came from all over and they showed up. And uh, the place is dusty. I mean, it's, you can tell it's dead. Well, we show up at the meeting, and, and, and I, I think I was scheduled to preach the second meeting. I stood up to preach, and I had a message prepared. It was on specific seed and harvest and planting the Word of God and stuff like that. And um, the first words out of my mouth, the very first thing I said when I got the microphone, I said, y'all, and I wasn't planning to say this. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was leaving it up to the Lord. But I got up to preach my message and the first thing out of my mouth was, we can get it to rain. <laughs> you know, you're, uh, the outside of you is not going to be happy by, uh, walking by faith. Your flesh is not happy walking by faith. Your flesh is happy when natural things take care of it. Your flesh is happy in the bathtub. Your flesh is happy when you eat a lot. Your flesh is happy in bed. Your flesh is happy when it does nothing. <laughs> So don't confuse it for, I just don't have any faith. No, your flesh never likes faith acts. So I'm thinking, what have I said now? I've got to follow through. And so I preached on uh, the kingdom of God and planting seed and getting harvest because of words and all that. And um, they started, when I said that the first time, I said, we can get it to rain. <laughs> Not a word. Not, not one word. I'm telling you dead silent. I wish I had video. Because they ain't got no faith that it can rain. If they had faith that it could rain, it would have rained. If you have faith for a miracle, it would have happened. Or if you had faith and planted it, it would have grown. If it hadn't grown, you ain't done it. You ain't got it. So anyway, I said that, and they, it was silence. Well, I started preaching my message. Forty-five minutes goes by, and it elevated from beginning to end. Forty-five minutes go by, and at the end of that message, they're fired up. I told them again, we can get it to rain. Yeah! <laughs> the Word of God can fire anything up. The Word of God gives life. Hallelujah. This word will never fail you. If you need life for today, it will, it will resurrect you. Yes. Just five scriptures will resurrect you. Hallelujah. Maybe just one. Yeah, that's right. Point is, just try it. Do something. And so I had them all stand up at the end. And, I, and I, I, I led them. I felt of the Lord that it wasn't for me to stand up and make a big declaration of, you know, Elijah type pronouncement of rain. <laughs> rather I felt like these are pastors they're responsible for their country they're responsible for their territory their people their, their livelihood so let me help them because then they can help their people I thought if I could just teach them how to take responsibilities take a stand of faith for something to happen in the earth that's godly that's a covenant promise that's what I need so I felt like that through the 45 minutes I realized that's what I'm going to have to do and so they stood up and I, I led them in confession I said, God's not going to let us fail. God's not going to let one more person die. We're going to make it. And I just had them confess all the truth of God. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that night, it rained. 
It rained all around the church camp. Not on the church itself, but in all the, the, the villages where people lived. The next morning we come back to the first meeting and they're translated through this, the whole thing. And the message, the, tra the testimony is, we prayed yesterday and it rained. Well, that's not really what happened. But that was the testimony. They were excited about it. We prayed and it rained. Well, I forgot to tell you this, but in the meeting, when I stood up and said we can get it to rain, and at the end, had him confess, I said, we don't need to pray. I had him stand up. I said, we don't, we're not going to pray for rain. Okay? We don't need to pray for rain. I said, praying for rain does not work. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. I said, praying for rain does not work. I said, if, it had, if praying for rain worked, it would have already rained because you've been praying. Yes. I said, has anybody here prayed for rain? How many of you have prayed for rain? Every one of them. Raise their hand up. Okay. I said, it didn't work. <laughs> I said, we don't need to pray for more. We don't need to pray again for rain. That's not what we need. We just need to command it to rain. We just need to declare what's going to happen. Hallelujah! I'm not again. Don't leave the meeting saying, "Well, he doesn't believe in prayer." <laughs> no, you you can pray, you can talk to God about anything, but recognize the secret to success. Jesus didn't say if you had faith in the mustard seed, you'd pray. He said you'd say. Yeah, that's true. So that night it rained. The testimony is it rained. Praise the Lord. I got up my first meeting and I said, "Guys, ladies and gentlemen, we did not pray for rain. I made them admit it." That's a principle. You have to know these things. Yeah, come on. The Christian for so long has been in milky, the Milky Way galaxy of Christianity. <laughs> Which is we're all praying for, begging God and praying more and begging God and praying for, begging God. We sure hope he says yes. For so long, Christianity has been found in milk that way and never hardly got miracles at all. Every once in a while, a little something happens, we blame it on God. That's good. <laughs> so I explained it to him. Well, the second night, it poured down rain. I mean, we were out in the van. We had to, went to another town to do some things and s visit something, see some, some people. And we hardly got back because it rained so hard. I mean, we were kind of, the, the van slipping and sliding on the dirt roads, trying to get through the, the jungle. And uh, it poured down rain. So the third morning... Or that second morning, uh, they show up at the meeting and the testimony through the translators is, thank God it has rained, but please, no more rain. Tell them to pray, no more rain, because it will flood. <laughs> this is faith. This is what faith does. Faith believes the promise of God. And even more than that, even more, more basic than that, believes the nature of God, yeah. that He is good to people. Yeah. And because He's good, I find promises that prove that He's good, and I stand on those, and He comes to pass for me. So the end of the third evening, or the third day we're leaving, and uh, the final testimony through the translators from the, the leaders and all that uh, was this. The Americans came and it rained. We thank God for the Americans. My first thought was, I need to be here for three months. Because they didn't get it. They probably still didn't get it. And that's a shame, isn't it? It doesn't change the principle of God. But it does mean that it takes time for us to get these things. These principles don't just come at the blink of an eye. You're going to have to go after these things. You know, overseas, that's the thought, is that the, the American, they have all the solutions. They have the money. They have the people that have knowledge. So all we need is an American. And it gets them focused on, on Americans rather than Jesus. Now, they love Jesus. Don't get me wrong. Some of them have some severe faith in many, in many arenas. But in that, they didn't. In taking a, an, a stand of authority on the Word of God, taking a stance of belief for God to come through, that's, that's what this faith message is all about. 
we read last week, that's what the word of faith is all about. It's believing and saying something in order for miracles to happen rather than praying and begging for miracles to happen. They don't happen that way. They happen God's way, the spirit of faith way. Amen? Amen. Mark Hankins said the, the spirit of faith will make you, make you want to swing out over hell on a corn stalk spitting the devil's eye. The spirit of, faith, spirit of faith will make a tadpole sw slap a whale. The spirit of faith will, will cause an ordinary person to stand up in the face of adversity and cause miracles to happen. The spirit of faith caused David to stand up in the face of the giant and win. But he, he had, it wasn't just like a, an accidental miracle that God wanted to happen so God slayed the giant. No, it's not, it didn't happen that way. It happened because a little ruddy fella who loved God and God's kingdom and God's people, he heard that there was a, a giant that had defied the armies of the living God. Right. Right. And he shows up at the battle and they all look at him like he's nuts and he said, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason for me to be here? Yeah. What can you do? You're too little. He said, I, I, I killed, the, I killed the, the lion and the bear. I can kill the giant. Yeah. Yeah. They tried to put natural solution for, oh, well then we need to give you a natural solution. Here's the natural armor. Couldn't fit him. He took it off. Got his slingshot in his, in his rock. Five rocks. Because even if the first miss, he's going to get it on the second. When, when you stand up in faith, it don't matter. I'm getting it. I, I don't care. I don't care what it looks like the first few times. I'm getting it. And so he stands up and the, and the giant looks at him and he laughs. Who are you? They send out a little, a little boy like you against a giant like me? He goes, I'm going to kill you. That's what the devil says. Sure. The devil's a giant. He stands up. He's, gonna, he's not just going to just fall down. Oh. The devil doesn't ever fall down. The challenges don't just say, oh, well, here you are. Do they? No, they stand up toe-to-toe -to -toe for a moment. The giant yelled at him and shouted at him, told him, I'm going to kill you and chop your head off. David said, who are you to defy the armies of the living God? Yeah. You, I'm going to chop your head off. You come at me with a spear, I come at you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah! The moral is, don't ever run at your giant with your mouth closed. This milky, silent, Christian, waiting, praying, hoping, wishing, forget it. You better stand up and mean it when you say it. Amen. I mean, David's knees might have been knocking when he said it, but he said it. Yeah, he did. Hallelujah. Well, he did it. And he chopped the, the giant's head off with his own sword. Glory to God. Everybody stand up, please. God takes ordinary people, fills them with faith, and sets them to change the world. Yeah. Calls them out, pushes them out, sets them on fire to change the world around them. 